Good day, Industrial Advisor listeners, and thank you for tuning in. If you have not subscribed, please do so by clicking subscribe wherever you podcast. Click the like button and hit the bell if you want notifications of when we put up new content. Leave us a comment about anything we discuss here today or general comments about the show. Now, let's get into it. Welcome to our Industrial Advisors podcast. You have Bill Condon and Matt McGregor, and we have an incredible guest here with us today. We have Jim Morris, Jim the Rookie Morris, and, and some of you may not know why Jim's uh, nickname is The Rookie, but I'll tell you why. So one of the best baseball movies ever made was called The Rookie, and it was based on Jim's incredible journey and how when he was uh, 20, 25 years old, he was told he wasn't going to be able to play professional sports or pitch again. And 10, 10 years later, Jim was making his major league debut for the Tampa Bay Devil Rays. Uh, 10 years and a few pounds. 10 years yeah. and a few pounds, right? <laughs> <laughs> but it's an incredible movie. Had a ton of success. It won the SB for Best Movie in 2012 and the Cami Award for Character and Morality and Entertainment. Jim was Jim's role was played by Dennis Quaid, who did an outstanding job. And I was telling Jim before we, we went live, my boys were super excited when I told them we were having Mr. Morris on the podcast today because they're huge baseball fans, love that movie. So it's really cool to have you, Jim. And, and Jim has also authored two books, the most recent one called Dream Makers. And Dream Makers really picked up where the rookie left off and it explores the power of surrounding yourself with the best, most accomplished people possible, inspiring you to overcome obstacles in life and really help you achieve your dreams. And Jim, we'll get into this later, but I know your grandfather was a really influential person in your life. So excited to hear more about that. Jim now is as busy probably as he's ever been. He's a motivational speaker. He's been traveling the world since 2001. He's participated in prestigious events like the Million Dollar Roundtable twice. He received a Lifetime Achievement Award in 2008 from the Bobby Bregan Youth Foundation and has also started a foundation in his name, which helps children in underserved communities find hope and inspiration through sports. Jim, really awesome to have you on our podcast. Thank you for joining us. I'm glad to be here. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I want to start with, when I think of your story, I think of resiliency. So maybe that's a really good place for us to start and you to just Talk to us about your approach and how you've been so uh, resilient over the years. I think men use resilient. I think women looking at men doing that probably use obstinate. <laughs> there, there's a lot of trying and failing, and I think we're missing that today with, with young people where they don't, they've never failed. And so the first time somebody tells them no, they lose their mind. And then I'm not going to do things this way. And I'm not going to do things that way because I've always had things exactly like I want them. And mom and dad always get me out of trouble. And, and we've ruined a whole generation by not telling people no. And no is a complete sentence. It doesn't need an answer behind it. And you know, we've raised five kids. And are they my best friends? No. Are they supposed to be? I'm a parent. My job was to raise them up in the way I want them raised, in a way they didn't have to be raised like I was raised. And so I think it's an epidemic right now in schools. And we've gone into inner city schools with sports programs. I'm friends with a lot of football players. And the people we've gotten on board to go into these schools and get kids back in between the white lines of a football field or a basketball court or whatever sport they choose. And for me, it was sport. And for some of my friends, it was sports, but it could be art. And it could be anything else. Whatever keeps those kids interested is keeping them off the street. And if we can keep them off the street, we can, we can talk about teamwork and we can talk about character. We can talk about morality. And we can talk about, like my grandfather Ernest said, there are good people and there are bad people. There's no color. There's two types of people, good and bad. And that's it. And we need to teach kids. They are very much worthy of our attention. And we need to give it. And I grew up one way and my kids grew up in a different era where the rookie came out. 
And so we lived in an affluent area in Northern Dallas and all these kids are driving BMWs and Mercedes to schools. And my kids are like, well, and when am I getting a BMW? And I'm like, when, when you pay for one and that's it. And then we moved back out in South Texas because we're not going to live like that. That's ridiculous. To try to uphold something like that. You're trying to live up to a goal. You don't even know you're living up to. And so for my kids to start there and see nothing but failure from that point, why not start down here and teach them what goals are and earning them? Because when you earn it, you want it a whole lot more than if somebody hands it to you. And it was a group of high school kids who taught me that when I was 35 years old. So ladies, yes, men are a little slow on the uptake. Jim, you, <laughs> you, uh, you mentioned your grandfather and a little bit about growing up. I know you had a, a very, you know, turbulent childhood, maybe touch a little bit about your growing up, your relationship with your grandfather, your grandparents, and maybe your experience with your father. The experience with my dad was that my parents had to get married and I was the blame for the, the whole ordeal. And it had such an effect on me that when I got older, I got a degree in science and found out that I had nothing to do that, with that. I was the end product of what they got in trouble for, but I took the blame for that. And so every time there was an argument, any time that something was done wrong, somehow the blame was mine. Well, if we hadn't had to get married, it hadn't been because of you. And here I am, this person who loves sports because my father's in the military. We're getting, we're traveling everywhere. Hmm. And so sport becomes my life because in between the white lines of that field, I can be the kid I'm supposed to be if only for a few hours at a time. And I've got another team full of friends who are going through the same things I'm going through. And I think our biggest deal is sometimes we think we're going through the worst thing possible that nobody else could possibly have ever gone through. Man, there's 8 billion people on the planet. There's somebody going through something way worse than we're going through right now. And we make up excuses not to succeed. So if we start to fail and we start to falter, we start to alter our dreams and we move off. And before we know it, we're chasing something we didn't even know we were looking after. So my grandfather taught me that my, probably the most influential man in my life who at 15 took me in off the street, Ernest and Alice, my grandparents, and they took a kid in and it was my father's parents. So I thought he came from somewhere. He's going to, they're like him. And when I walked in, they gave me two rules. If you do it, own it, own it, live up to it and move on. And number two, tell the truth. Those are my two rules. That's it. Had me take my grandmother on lunch date. So I would know how to treat women, take their arm across the street, open car doors, restaurant doors, pull out chairs, fold out napkins, holding doors for people, even if they don't want it. Why? Because it's the right thing to do. Don't listen to somebody go, oh, that's not how you say it. Well, I don't know you, so I don't know how to say it. So here, I'm supposed to open a door. I'm opening a door for you. And because that's just what, how it is. And he taught me that, how to shake hands firmly, look people in the eye. Yes, sir. No, sir. Yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. And he sold, a men, he sold menswear clothes in Brownwood, Texas, population 20,000 people. Started it from the ground up. But his thing was... And I worked for him in the summers during lunchtime and he'd look at me. And I think one of the most poetic things he ever told me was, he goes, I'm not selling these suits. I'm selling me. And if they buy me, they're going to come back and get my suits. And so then several years ago, probably 10 years ago now, I'm down in Houston doing a speech. Well, sure. And I learned this at a later age when I had kids that Men don't know how to cry until the baby or doctor puts the baby in your arms and all of a sudden men get tear ducts and you start bawling. So after my speech, this man's about 95. He's walking down towards me. He's crying. So before he even gets to me, I don't even know what he wants. I'm crying. And he walks up to me. He goes, I am so glad I came here tonight. 40 years ago, 45 years ago, I walked into your grandfather's store and I said, I'm going to be an accountant for this firm in Dallas and they want me to run an entire floor. And I had this big smile on my face and I was looking for suits to go to work 
And your grandfather looked at me and he said, why would you ever work for anybody else with the way that you know how to run numbers? He goes, I came here to tell you that because of that talk, not only did I walk out of my store with my head held higher than I would have had I heard what I wanted to hear at that time, but last week I just sold the last of my nine banks all because your grandfather said that I should be running numbers for myself and not other people. Wow. And then he opened his jacket up and it had Ernest Morris menswear. Had to be four decades old. That's it was just awesome. awesome. <laughs> That's so cool. That is great. What a story. I have not read Dream Makers yet, but I'm going to for sure. Tell us a little bit about the book and why you wrote it and a little bit about, you know, more about it in detail. The book is a pain in the rear end. And when you're forced to sit down and look at yourself and be introspective, some things you look at, you really don't want to look at. And for 20 years, everybody, their favorite questions in the Q and A after speeches would be the story's great. Dennis was awesome. They did a great job doing it. What's happened since then? And so we just started working with that and I never had an ending. Well, because of my grandparents' faith, my grandparent, my grandfather, Ernest, was a deacon in our church. My grandmother was a church secretary for 30 years. And so I was at church, but it wasn't religion church. It was church. They were people who knew, even though they weren't rich, how to give back and help other people keep chasing their dream. So I watched them buy Thanksgiving dinners and Christmas presents for families with kids that didn't have anything and how a bill would show paid when somebody would get it in the mail and nobody ever knew how it got paid, but it had paid in full on it. And my grandparents did that anonymously. They didn't want the credit. And those were my teachers. And so to have them put into my life at a time when I could easily run off the rails and have him teach me the lessons that he taught me about character, he taught me about morality, he taught me about keeping my word. And then one day it wasn't even everything he said. And this story still gets me because nobody knows who this lady was. And she walks in right after we open on a Monday morning and all the men around his age, salesmen were in the back of the store on the suit side, having coffee. They look around the corner. They see how the bell goes off on the front. They see this lady overall straw hat boots. Let's just say she worked on a pig farm. You could smell it. Nobody wanted to wait on her. They ignored her. She didn't exist. My grandfather from his side of the store sees her from the office, gets up, treats her like she should be treated. And before she left his store, she bought 15 suits for every male in her family with shirts, ties, socks, shoes, all because of how he treated her. Wow. Because I'm not selling suits. I'm selling me. And she bought him. And she came back every year while he was alive and bought suits from him. She paid in cash. You know what else? The following year, underneath that lady's pig farm, natural gas. Wow. $800 million later, she kept oh coming. Oh, my gosh. And into the door. Wow. That's amazing. That is amazing. Well, Jim, I'm sure you, were, you wish your grandparents were around to watch the movie The Rookie. But tell us about that movie, what it meant to you, you know, just tell us about how it came about and what it's done for your life. Two things real quick before we get into the movie. One, after the movie came out, my ex-mother-in-law, who loved me up until she died, she said, there are people on the corners, kids, who are picking to be and fighting to be Jim Morris. As they're picking sides, and I'm like, you have got to be kidding me. <laughs> and then when Alice was still alive, my grandmother, she would call me. She was a lady of food. Well, she worked. Matt, she would call me, and she'd go, hi, Jim. How you doing? I love you. I miss you. But I'd be quick, gone. I mean, you couldn't get a word in. And I would pick up the phone, and all I would hear is crying. And I said, you're watching again, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> and... That was how we communicated. Amazing. Wow. But we were doing, okay, second day in the big leagues, I go from Arlington to Anaheim, where we have a four-day set with the Angels. Bill Plasky, LA Times, writes a huge article, interviews all the kids from West Texas, puts it on the front page of the sports page, Sunday page. 
I go downstairs into the restaurant, not knowing anything. I'm just a stupid new rookie dude. And I open it up and I pull out the sports page and it's my picture with all my kids painted down the whole page, the whole page. I look up, everybody in the restaurant is looking at me. I shoved the paper back in and that's when I discovered room service. So I do room service, but over the next four days, they had to change my name in the hotel. We oh, documentaries, movies, newspaper articles, magazine articles, all kinds of stuff. Just people came out of the woodwork. So for four days, Steve Canner, my agent and I went around Hollywood and Burbank meeting people and everybody I met, let's just say I didn't care for it. Sure. And there were some people, I thought there were some very nice people, but the people in charge, I didn't care for not. I'm from Texas. I don't fly. <laughs> and so we get out at Disney and Steve's looking over at me. He goes, okay, we've been to all these companies, man. We're, this is Disney. This is where your old roommate's a producer. He's pitched this to Iger. What are you going to do? He goes, what do you want? I said, I want a movie about kids who are counted out from the beginning. They were never going to succeed no matter what they did. Somebody was just going to push them down and they were going to keep going. I said, the other part of that, second chance for adults who are actually willing to go out there and take it and get after it. I want that in a movie. We go upstairs and we sit down and Mark is sitting behind Iger and Steve's sitting next to me. And he points at me, he goes, what we have is a movie about kids who have been counted out from the beginning. And I looked at Steve and I went, Mickey Mouse has big ears, man. <laughs> and, <laughs> and we were sold because they had it. And they were starting, they started talking about people wanting to play me. And, you know, when I taught, when I played anything I did, sarcasm has, has ruled my life. And so in back of my mind, I'm like, well, it's not going to be John Candy because he's not alive. And Chris Farley, he's on his way out. That's not going to be him. And they're like, no, no, no. And. There were Brad Pitt and Matthew McConaughey, Aaron Eckhart, and Jim Caviezel, Dennis Quaid, who told me, if you see anything being filmed you don't like, you tell me it's out. He wow. and I are still friends to this day. Wrote the foreword to the book, Dream Makers. I had to quit crying after I read it because I couldn't believe it. I wasn't going to bother him. My wife did. That's, That's amazing story. That is remarkable. How long did that take to produce, by the way? Just curious. The whole movie process? Yeah. Man, we were on set for four and a half months. And I think they went back and they refilmed just a few short things on the side of the road a month later. But other than that, it was just breaking stuff down in Burbank and then cutting it together and put music with it, which I had no idea about, right? Yeah. There were like three or 400 people on a movie set and they filmed something. They're looking at you like, do you like it? And I'm like, I don't know what you're doing. So I don't know. <laughs> But it was a lot of fun because everybody was really nice to me. And you know, Dennis, above all, you know, the first day he came over to me, he goes, why aren't you having fun? And I say, because everybody keeps staring at me like I know what they're doing. And I've never done anything like this in my life. He goes, it doesn't happen to everybody. He goes, enjoy it. He goes, we're fixing to do the bet. What would you do? And so I'd start rattling off stuff that I said to the team. He's not writing anything down. And I'm like, he's not going to remember anything. Big deal. They go back. Gets in front of the team, they yell action, and he starts saying word for word what I'd said for 15 minutes. And I'm like, Jeez. oh, yeah, you're an actor. Ah, I get it. <laughs> and we just became friends. I, we'd go to dinner, go watch him play golf. We'd, we'd go watch him play concert a lot when we're filming in Austin. And I go down to 6th Street and watch him play. And I just boundless energy. And the guy's just extremely talented. And we just had a good time together. And there's some people go, I didn't have fun with who played me and they didn't keep it true. And that's not really how it happened. I don't have that complaint. And Dennis so and good. I are still friends, it's still surreal. Like if I'm walking around or we're driving, my phone beeps and I look down and has Dennis Quaid written across. I'm like, what? Other than that, if I get over that, I'll, I'll be doing pretty good. That's amazing. That's Great a really, story. yeah, that's a really cool story. So tell us a little bit about what life is like today, you, you know, you mentioned Dennis has a lot of energy. So do you, you had mentioned to us that you'd only had about seven days off this summer. You're out traveling a lot, motivational speaking. So tell us what a normal week in the life of Jim Morris today is. 
Uh, this week, we are at my daughter's house. We're watching Sophie Grace today and tomorrow. Sophie's one. She's my height. I'm 6'3". She's going to be tall. Yeah. She's not 6'3". She's 6'3". <laughs> this would be a different phone call. Right. <laughs> but then we got to go home, pack, and get on a plane and take off for the next two weeks. And we're going to go to Oklahoma. And we're going to go to Virginia. And we're going to go to Kentucky. And we're going to go to Idaho. And we'll for see some you reason, in Idaho. Idaho is going to be a lot of fun. I'm looking forward to it. I've not yeah, been to that be fun. part. And it's just been a blast. I, I got a couple of compliments from some bureaus yesterday that made me feel really good. And they were like, now oh, that person was really good and stuff, but that they weren't Jim Morris. And that impressed the lady so much, the person who brought me in, that they called Sean and told her about it. And I just thought that was cool because when this started, Back in 2000, and my agent, Steve, he goes, you're going to be a speaker. You're the most talked to the most introverted person on the planet, man. I'm not talking to nobody. I, and I, you I, can't I, make I, me. I'm way I, bigger than you. And I'm fat. I'll sit on you. <laughs> and, you know, he brings this guy in from Kansas City. He's going to stay for five hour, five days. He stays for less than five hours. And we do two speeches. He looks at me and he goes, Tony Robbins is Tony Robbins. They're going to love you because you're you. You go be you and you're going to be fine. They're going to eat you up. He goes, just don't push your glasses up with your middle finger. Smile at people and let them know they can mess up. You did. They did. We all became successful and move on. And he went home. I still had to pay him, but he went home. <laughs> That's amazing. Well, tell us, Jim, a little bit about your, the, the foundation, Bragdon Youth Foundation your affiliation Bobby, with that Bobby, and what yeah bobby bragan i wasn't really a part of it and didn't really know about it back until like 2007 somebody goes you were nominated for bobby bragan's lifetime achievement award i'm like i don't even live in fort worth what is going on and then i started looking at people who won it and i was just i was blown away and it ended up being you know it's for middle school kids who are going into higher education and they get ready for kids to go to college and so everybody wants to be a part of that. And if you can use sport or art, whatever your talent is, and we're all different, we're talented in different things. I can teach baseball and I can teach a game of inches, but I can't teach a math class and I'm not going to try. That's not my thing. <laughs> and so we've all got our specialties, but Bobby brought me up there and he sang me a song on stage that I thought was powerful at the time. And then like six months later, he passed away. And so that award means a lot to me. The Cami Award means a lot for character, morality, and the movie. The ESPY Award, I kept it for almost 20 years. Then I gave it to Dennis, and now he's got it. He said, I'll keep it for 20, then I'll give it back. And we're both old, so we'll see if that crap happens. I don't know if that'll happen or not. <laughs> well, Jim, I just want to thank you. Your journey is a remarkable one. It's instrumental for people to hear it, influential for people to hear it. It's been really cool for us to, to have you on this podcast. So I appreciate you taking the time. We know how busy you are. So thank you for taking the time with us today. And we'll look forward to seeing you in Idaho because we'll be at that same conference. Absolutely. I got one more grandfather story for you. Let's Great. hear it. And I, we're not even going to run out of close to him. But one day I was working for my grandfather in the store. And this man walks in and I know him. He's on TV and this is, I'm 59. This is, this is back when there was three channels and I was the remote control, right? There was the news or Walter Cronkite and, and there was gun smoke and we're watching something and gun smoke was usually the winner. And, but I'm like, he walks up to Ernest and hugs him like they've been best friends forever. I later found out and the war they had been, and he had flown in from Anaheim, came into Brownwood to buy suits for my grandfather, go hunting hang out for a week and go back. And it was Gene Autry. And I'm like, you got to be kidding what? me. And so I'm telling Dennis this on the podcast in 2020. And I go, yeah, this guy walks in. I recognize him on TV, he walks up. I my grandfather, they great friends, hung out for a week, hugged each other. They left. He goes, he made me repeat it. And I did. And he goes, so I played you in a movie and your grandfather was my uncle's best friend. Jeez. And I went, you know what? As big as the world is, it's a lot smaller than what we think it is. Wow. That's right. 
That is incredible. So that, that was my brush when I was a teenager with, wow, my grandfather does know everybody. Yes, <laughs> clearly. Well, well again, that is wonderful. Yeah, that's Thank great. Thank you so much, Jim. Looking forward to meeting you uh, in person in, uh, in Boise in a couple of weeks. Absolutely. Yeah, in a couple of weeks. We'll be there, man. Have a great, great couple of weeks in the hey. meantime. And thanks again. <laughs>